Hey, I'm Cameron Coward, and today I'm going to show you how I pleased my wife. No, not like that. This is a device that displays text messages on an e-paper screen so we can leave each other notes. It's a project I've dubbed Love Newts, like love notes, but in the kind of cutesy voice couples use that makes everyone else want to vomit. The cool part is that anyone who knows the phone number can send a text message to the device and it will show up on the display. I wanted to build this because my wife gets up very early for work while I get to sleep in like a degenerate. So I'm up a lot later than her and often think of nice things to say that I want to tell her. I then promptly forget about them. Love Newts lets me display those messages by the door so she can see them on her way out in the morning. She can also display messages of her own by simply sending a text message. So I'll know she wants me to pick up milk from the grocery store or whatever. We can even give the phone number to friends and family uh, so they can post messages to us from anywhere in the world. And because it's required by law for every IoT device, Love Newts also displays the weather information on the bottom of the screen. When a new message comes in, it automatically shows up on the screen and a blue light turns on. After 12 hours without interaction, that light will turn off, but the message remains on the screen unless a new message comes in. There's also a button so that either of us can turn off the notification light after we've read the message. The hardware inside is actually pretty simple. It's just a WaveShare 6-inch e-paper screen, the controller that came with that, and an ESP32 development board. But the software chain to get a message onto the screen is an overcomplicated mess. Let me explain. Let's say that I want to tell my wife how pretty she is. I, want, I take out my iPhone and type a text message, then send it to the phone number I registered for this project. That's a Google Voice phone number. Google Voice receives the text message and then forwards it to Gmail as an email. My Gmail then forwards it to a cloud service called Zapier Email Parts Parser, which scrapes the email and extracts just the text from the original text message. A Zapier Zap then grabs that text and sends it as an email to a second Gmail account. Every email to that second Gmail account then goes through IMAP to Home Assistant running on my home server. A Home Assistant automation then grabs the text from each received email and sends it to the MQTT broker running on the same home server. The MQTT broker then posts that text message to a specific topic, which the ESP32 in the Love Newt's device listens to. When the ESP32 sees a new message on the topic, it takes the text from the payload and uses my clunky algorithm to print the text onto the e-paper display. The weather information also comes in over MQTT, but Home Assistant can pull that information directly from a weather integration. So why is Love Newt's playing this ridiculous game of telephone? There are a couple of reasons. First, I wanted the user experience to be as seamless as possible, and the text messages seemed like a good choice for that. They also naturally limit the length of the message, which is important because the Home Assistant MQTT integration only seems to be capable of a payload of about 240 characters, and I couldn't find a way to change that. More importantly, this entire thing struggles with special characters. To explain, let's take a little detour for a quick lesson on character sets. A character set is the thing that tells a computer or device what alphanumeric character, punctuation mark, or symbol you want it to work with. It can then load a font for that particular character to render or print. But there are several different character sets in use today. The old school ASCII character set stores its entire library of characters in 7 bits, so there are 128 slots to work with. The first 32 are control characters to handle things like breaks, carriage returns, and so on. That leaves 96 characters for all the lowercase letters, the capital letters, punctuation marks, mathematical symbols, and other symbols. As you can imagine, this is very limiting. There isn't, for example, enough room for the accent marks or characters used in languages other than English. So thoughtful and inclusive developers created the UTF-8 character set, as well as many others. UTF-8 can store characters in up to 4 bytes, or 32 bits, which means the possibilities are almost endless. To bring things back to this project, what do you think happens when one device tries to speak UTF-8 to a device that can only hear ASCII? It depends, but in this case, 
Lovenutz kept trying to display the UTF-8 character code in a hexadecimal on the screen in ASCII characters. In particular, it struggles with the stylized quotation marks and apostrophes used in modern word processing, which are distinct from their standard cousins in the ASCII character set. I spent days trying to figure out a good solution to this problem. I couldn't find one, so I settled on the messy software chain that I've already described. SMS messages are plain text and they shouldn't contain any special UTF-8 characters. A Zapier email parser is able to pull just that text and send it as an HTML formatted email that announces itself as UTF-8, just in case. That tells Home Assistant that it needs to do some translating before it sends the ASCII MQTT message. All of the real developers out there probably hate me right now and I sincerely apologize for my offensive actions, but this does work. In comparison, the rest of the project was all unicorns and rainbows. The ePaper libraries for Arduino that work with this particular display are pretty rudimentary and don't have any kind of fancy word wrapping. So they just cut off a word when it reaches the end of the screen and then print the next character on the following line. I wrote an algorithm that solves that by adding one character at a time. If that character is a space, it knows it reached the end of the word. It then checks to see if the current line, including that word, fits on the screen. If it does, it continues on. If it doesn't, it removes the last word and prints the line to the screen, then repeats for the next line. Each line has its text bounds calculated so it can be centered on the screen. Now that you understand the shameful theory going on behind the scenes, I can show you how to physically assemble a Love Newt's device. All right, so I'm gonna show you how this all goes together. Uh, these are our electronic components. So this is the e-ink screen from Waveshare. Uh, you can see that it's still displaying some text because e-ink screens uh, only need power to refresh the screen, not to display anything. So even though this has no power, it'll just keep displaying the last thing written to the screen. Uh, this board is just a connector for an adapter for the ribbon cable to this ribbon cable, um, which goes to the controller from Waveshare. This is a Raspberry Pi hat style uh, controller, which is why it's pretty big and has has these adapters on there. Um, and then that goes to the SPI connection to an ESP32 development board. And then finally, we have just a regular push button. Um, this ESP deve ESP32 development board is mostly stock, although there was a power LED right here, which I removed because I don't want there to be a, uh, that's a red LED. I don't want it to constantly be showing that, you know, bright red LED. So the only, uh, so there's still a blue LED on there, which is a notification LED for when a new message is on the screen, uh, that'll automatically disappear after 12 hours or push this button and it'll make that notification LED turn off on its own. Those go into this 3D printed enclosure, which I printed on a Bamboo Lab P1S 3D printer. I've already stuck the heat set inserts where they need to go for the screws so that everything can go together here while I show it to you. Now, once this is assembled, it will look like that. And then it will mount to the wall using these command strips. Just put a couple of them right there and then it will stick to the wall. Power cable will come out through the bottom there. And uh, that's how it should all go together. So let me put this together and you can see how everything fits. Now I haven't actually fully assembled this yet, so hopefully everything fits as designed. We'll see. All right, so the e-ink screen just fits oh, fits into place right here. Now the, um, the ribbon cable is taped down here because that's a really delicate cable and I didn't want it to break off here. Uh, but this cable is a little bit stronger so it's meant to fold over like this and the controller goes right there with just a few M2 screws into the heat set inserts. Um, you can use some short ones 
for holding this board in place. Let's grab four of those. And then these can just secure the board in place here. Just kind of lightly put that in first so we can make sure they all line up before we tighten them down. So that's in place. Now the cover is designed, or the back plate is designed to hold the screen in place. So there's nothing that needs to be screwed in place because this, this screen doesn't have any uh, mounting holes on it. So it just fits there. And then these elevations are set so that this will push there to hold the screen in place. This is opened up a little bit to a, uh, allow this ribbon cable and that adapter to, to feed over here. Um, next, we have this, the button here. Uh, I have this connected to ground and pin 22 on the ESP32 development board. So let's we'll unplug those. Take off the washer and nut. Then we can feed this through through here so it'll fit on the front there then we can put the nut or the, the lock washer and the nut on Washer isn't really necessary. Um, this isn't going to be in, under any kind of like stress, but it just helps. Might as well use it. And getting these nuts on when you're in a tight space like this can be a little tricky, but should just thread on once we get it into the right position. Is that going on? threading on. I'll turn it a little bit at a time. Again, I'm not concerned about getting this like super tight because there really isn't going to be any stress on this. There's not going to be any vibrations or anything. It's just mounting to a wall. Just enough to get it tight on there so it doesn't, you know, wobble around. That should be good. Uh, then we can reconnect that to the pins of the ESP32 development board, uh, which were, again, they were ground and pin 22. Uh, polarity doesn't matter. And all it's doing is just when you push the button, it's just completing the circuit. So when, you know, polarity doesn't matter in that regard. Um, and this is designed so that this, the, the ESP32 just fits into this spot right here, which gives room for the um, uh, micro USB plug to fit out the bottom. And then these cables just tuck down there. And then when this is in place, this, big block right here, pushes against the board here to hold it in place. And then if everything goes together like it should, then we just need to put in the four mounting screws and then it will be done and ready to go. Feels like something's pushing on there. Not quite sure what. So I see the problem. What I did is made a mistake with my dimensions for this part. This block is too far that way, so it's actually pushing against the pin headers right here. And I can't get it fully in place that way. So what I'm going to have to do 
is if I wanted to be sloppy, I could break this off and then glue it into place just a little bit further over. Um, but I think what I'm actually going to do is reprint this part with the this block moved over. It only needs to go about 10 millimeters that way. Um, so I'll reprint it like that. Everything else should be the same. And then, uh, and then I, that that should hold this in place. I can do that and then screw this down and then the assembly will be done. So I'll reprint that and then I'll um, do another quick video just showing you that, uh, that going together. All right, so I've reprinted the back plate here with that uh, block moved slightly so that it now, when it goes on, it will push down on the ESP32 dev board and hold it in place. This should fit in that channel. So, should go together just like that. Um, let's grab a few of these longer screws. And these will just um, go in these four corners to hold the cover in place. These screws. So the heat set inset, uh, inserts in these two corners are shorter than the ones in those two corners. It looks like these screws might actually be a little too long for those two corners, so we use some shorter ones for those. It looks like those are just barely the right size. There are slightly shorter ones in this kit, so the, what I'm using here are six millimeter. There's some four millimeter ones in there that could have used if these were still too long, but it doesn't look like that's going to be necessary. Actually, might have been slightly too long. It's actually see that little dot it's trying to push through, but we'll just pretend that didn't happen because I don't want to have to re reprint that, but looks like that is all in place. Everything feels secure. So that is the way it's supposed to go together. Uh, so if you're going to buy, try to assemble this and buy this, when you do this, you'll want to use the four millimeter screws, not the six millimeter in order to avoid getting that, but I'm not going to worry about it because it's not that noticeable. Um, yeah, so there you go. Just use command strips to attach to a wall, plug in power, and you're ready to go. If you want to replicate this project, you'll probably want to rewind and rewatch my explanation of the software chain. You'll need a Gmail account registered with Google Voice for a phone number. You'll need a second Gmail account or filtering for the first account to put parsed emails into a dedicated folder. You'll need a Zapier account and a Zapier email parser account. You'll need a home assistant running on a local server with MQTT, IMAP, and weather integrations. And finally, you'll need an MQTT broker. Fortunately, all of those services and software are free. If that hasn't scared you away, then you're a brave person and the reward for your courage is my dirty nasty code. You can find it at the link in the description. That will include the ESP32 code, the Home Assistant Automation YAML code, some information on the Zapier setup, and the 3D printable files for the enclosure. Thanks for watching and if you want to see more projects like this, then please subscribe.